Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fielka. Today is Feb 9, 2024. We want to thank Rob Grant and his amazing podcast, I'm Probably Wrong About Everything. It's an honor and a pleasure today to be here with Janie Geyser. Janie, where in the heck are you calling in from? I'm, I'm just across town from you. I'm on the east side of Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Glassell Park. Do you know that neighborhood? I don't know it well, it's but I'm kind of near Mount Washington and Eagle Rock, and it looks across the hills to Echo Park. Oh, how cool! It's very close to downtown, actually, too. Very cool. The first question is: What is the best thing for a human being? Oh, the best thing. Well, air. I like that. I don't get that that often. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I go into places and I'm like. Can you please open a window? Yeah. You know, I need air. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's my answer, air. That's good. What's your favorite form of information? How it comes into you? Mm -hmm. Looking. Oh, I like that. Just like taking a walk and looking, walking around a city or a neighborhood and looking. I love it. And why do you think humans collect or gather information? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, somehow all of it is to make meaning of our lives, I think, yeah. you know, that we're just, we're like funnels and stuff comes in and then we go, why are we here? And, and we don't know, but maybe the, maybe the answer will be somewhere in there or the answer yeah. will be, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Well, that's the, this series is all about for 40 years. I'm totally open for people saying, I don't know, or I can't answer that. Uh -huh. But um, the, the next one is a follow-up. Do you think this need or want to collect information is more innate or more invented? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about, you know, when you read about how we were as humans when we were starting, hunter gatherers you know we were we couldn't cook yet we couldn't you know do a lot of the things we now can do we didn't have our implements and we just gathered so maybe yeah. but now we gather things that we can't eat um exactly that, that comes from somewhere else but i guess you know we gather yeah we gather things to make ourselves feel comfortable and safe and happy Good. And sometimes the opposite. <laughs> yes. Do thoughts create emotions? Oh, do thoughts create emotions? I, th I think they're really intertwined. Yeah. Um, that it's not one or the other. Thoughts certainly can evoke emotions and emotions can evoke thoughts. So, yeah. So fill in the blank, Janie. I don't know what I think until I dream. Oh my God. I never get that. That is so beautiful. See, McLuhan says, I don't know what I think until I say it. And Joan Didion says, I don't know what I think until I write it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can humans think without language? Absolutely. Wow. I have no doubt because I, I mean, I'm human, I think. And I sometimes just think in pictures and I realize I'm just lost in that. And I'm like, what was I thinking about? But yeah. I can't tell you any language from it. Beautiful. Chomsky says the language is not just words. It's, uh, a, cult, it's a culture, a tradition, a unification of community, a whole history that creates what a community is. Uh. What do you do when language doesn't work? When language breaks down, what do you do? You mean by myself or with someone else? Like either, whatever context you want. Sort of like with, yeah, it, either way, yeah. Well, language is always breaking down for me. Uh, I mean, I, I lose track of it. You know, I, I start to go into some place that isn't language. And so I just, sometimes I try to pull myself back and realize where I am. Maybe looking helps me when I lose language. Um, maybe I'm going to move on because I don't really have a clear answer. That, no, that's good, though. Looking is really good. One person said a, a, a fun answer once. I says, what do you do when language breaks down? And, and he said, group hug. 
Oh, that is <laughs> touching. Yeah. Touching. Yeah. But looking is something you've stressed twice. I like that. Do, your observations of humans in general, are we more feeling beings or more thinking beings? I don't know humans in general. I only really know myself. Except right. I observe humans in general, and I, I think it's more of a spectrum. It's both, yeah. See, we... Uh, we you know what? I'm not a binary person. So these some of the core questions yeah. for me are, what? It's somewhere in the yeah. middle. Yeah. Sometimes, or some of these early questions are binary, and it's really, they're just prompts for you yeah. to say, you don't have to answer the question because you, we invented the words feeling and thinking, so we think we can separate it. You can't separate it. They're like this. Yeah. That's but uh, I like Bridget Bardot says, when I make love, I don't think. And I'm like, good luck. How do you turn your brain off from thinking like when you're doing you know, this amazing physical thing, or like when people meditate, they go, okay, now think about not thinking. Yeah. That's too hard. <laughs> Whenever yeah. I think about not thinking, I get lost in my inability to not think. Yes. Um, these are two questions from Alan Turing in the fifties. One is thinking a function of the soul. Hmm. Well, you'd have to define soul for me. Yeah. To that and I think that's also something that's really different for everyone but I guess everything we do as humans is a function of our soul if we believe in our soul right that's good the second Turing question is can machines think hmm. machines I mean I don't know because I'm not inside a machine but to me it seems like they can calculate they can manipulate and now, of course, we're in a time where there's all the thinking machines. But I think we, I think we probably need to really define what thinking is to be able to answer that question. Yeah. We as humans, need to define that. Maybe we shouldn't ask the machines what is thinking, because they would include themselves. Yeah, I'm dying to ask: Have you or Lewis tried Mid Journey, where you ask this um, a computer to make a film, like make a film across between, you know, Larry, Larry Jordan and Jordan Belson <laughs> as a Cal Art student. I mean, you can actually have a machine make right. this. And I'm curious because I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by all that, but I really haven't tried it yet. Yeah, I haven't tried it yet. I'm sort of a little. I, I I'll mean, let up. Let other people try it. <laughs> also, like, who's got the time? But I guess, right, who's got the time? That's good. Although, I mean, I was talking to a really good film student the other day who's just got, you know, she's a real experimental filmmaker. And um, they, they were talking about using AI to generate something like some some images that then they could jump off of but not using those images necessarily in the film so i think the students are using it a lot and our yeah. our son um is a painter and tattoo artist and he's using some kind of ai in the tattoo work you know where he might have looked for google images before now he's sort of looking that way some so they're they're jumping on it so wow it's, it's curious to me do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? Probably meaning. Yeah. Well, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, he says, happiness doesn't tend to last, meaning does. Hmm. I mean, I search for meaning, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. I think it's the process of trying to make meaning. It's just a way of grappling with life. Yeah. Um, that... It's, I feel like that's just all I'm trying to do for myself. Not, I'm, I'm not interested in trying to make meaning for other people and say, this is the meaning. Right. The process is the meaning for me. Process is an important word. That's so cool. So does the brain more detect consciousness or create it? Like is consciousness there bubbling away and we're more detecting it or more creating it? Mm, that's a really good question. My impulse is detecting. Yeah. But I'm not I'm I'm not sure. But no, I appreciate it because that's what I'm after. Your impulse, your hunch, your guess. That's really cool. What's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? 
Hmm. I think thought. Yeah. There's no right or wrong answers, but that yeah. one you got right. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't know. It was pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it when people say thought because anyways. But, but wait, how do you measure that? Is there somebody who measured that? Well, the thing is, is that if humans can measure the speed of light mm -hmm. because they've devised some sort of system, yeah. well, how do you know if that's correct? I mean, it's pretty correct. We kind of go along with science and physics. But speed of thought to me is what we exist in. Yeah. We are existing in speed of thought. There is no speed of thought. It is just there. You yeah. know, so it's a, it's a meta. Lot, some of these questions too are people aren't sure if I'm saying literally or metaphorically. And then I just say, hey, you put it in the context you want. You can do it either way. Right. So Audre Lorde, the poet said, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Yvonne Rayner responded and said, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? Oh, I don't know. Those are both great quotes, and I agree with both of them. Um, what new tool do I suggest? I might have to come back on that. Um, and it's more so, Janie, what, what, and it doesn't even have to be new. It's what tool do you gravitate towards? Um, well, I, again, looking. Um, well, I, in my own life, I gravitate toward materials that I right. somehow process through ha hand relating to the hand and eye to yeah. come out the other end as something else. No, that all that is good. Sense. That makes a lot of sense. Looking process material hand eye. That's brilliant. I, I appreciate that. What new toy do you suggest? Oh, anything with a lens. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, just that's the thing I pick up all over the place, you know, just always like, you know, things that have lenses. That, oh, yeah, I like that. Oh, that is so cool. I mean, this was just in the old days a few years ago when the New York Times started doing... Um, I don't know. They put videos embedded in their website yeah. that you could use these with. Oh, no, you put your phone in it or something. I can't even remember. Yeah, wow. you put your phone to it. So they sent, sent, you know, we have a subscription, so they, they sent a pair. But mainly, I just use them under the camera in a film. Right. <laughs> That's. Like, I'm going to look. I bet you I'll dumpster dive one of those this week now. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people got sent them, and they're sitting around. Yeah. Yep. What do you worry about when you go to bed at night? Oh, everything. <laughs> I worry about oh my son, our son. Uh, I worry about just life and staying healthy and the crazy politics of this country. And I worry more about like the real world stuff. Yeah. Once in a while, I worry about what I'm making, you know, but yeah. more, my worries are more grounded in day to day life. Yeah. McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound, the poet, that artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting and detecting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions. So we might learn how to cope with what we don't like about our inventions. Mm -hmm. So, Janie, I asked you the question Marshall probed his whole career. Why do we ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though the artist are broadcasting them to us. Well, who is the we you're talking about? Yeah, and the and I and I don't want to sound like uh, elitist. We meaning the creators, the artists, or we meaning the consumers, or just people in general. It's not like do people look at art and really get sort of the hidden meaning of art, or do they look at it casually? Why do they ignore kind of the deeper meaning to art? Is kind of the question. I think that I'm not somebody who generalizes about people. Yeah. Like if you go to say a, an exhibit. Yeah. There's going to be people there who are maybe looking at it in a, in a more surface way. And there's people there who might start crying. So yeah. I think the art is there, you know, the artists antennas are out 
sometimes in a really profound way, sometimes not. Yeah. And, and it's really up to each person to take it in as much as they can. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, not everyone has grown up with a practice of looking at art. Music is more like pop culture and music is a place where I think people receive that more I don't yeah. know, easily, but more broadly because it's part of their lives. And unfortunately, you know, in America, the art education has gone down the hill. You know, I never had real art education in any of my schooling till college. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the, the the art in my elementary school, and I had, went to a really nice neighborhood Catholic school, but we colored in the lines. That was our yes. art. Or we would make those turkeys with your hand, you know. Um, and then in high school, I, I tried to take art my senior year, and they wouldn't let me because they said art is one is not for seniors, um, you know. And, and also because I was on a more academic track. So they said, that's really not for your track. You know, so that was really awful. So wow. that made me take it in college and then my whole life changed. It's amazing. You touched on so many things that resonate with me. And one, I was curious because it really is, it's not, once the artist makes their art, it's no longer theirs. The user right. can do whatever they want with it. Exactly. And, and so, um, you know, I interviewed Mike Kelly twice with all these questions. And um, I was always amazed when he died, the uh, New York Times obit said, one critic says, his art made me feel soiled. And I was like, oh my God. And I mean, I understand that. And is art supposed to do that? But here's the line that Mark said, uh, excuse me, that Mike said, that I'm just curious if you have any reaction to it. Mike said, Art is making your problems other people's problems. Oh, that's <laughs> beautiful. I mean, I remember when I first started seeing his work, which was all the crocheted and yeah. the handmade dolls that he found in thrift stores and stuff. It really made me cry. You know? Did it really? Oh, my God. Yeah. So these, uh, that's sort of what we were talking about before the live feed started, like all these abandoned objects that, you know, have such a history with the people that they came from yeah. you know, that made them or gave them to their grandchild or the kid who played with them. And then they get abandoned, either somebody dies or the kid grows up and feels like, no, this is baby stuff. That's a, another problem with our culture. But he recognized this is not baby stuff or yeah. it is baby stuff and we're all babies. But, you know, he he really moved me, you know. There's a flip there too, Janie. I interviewed him at Bergamot and um, there was a crowd there and uh, I asked him this question about children's art and Salvador Dali and something. And he started to cry. He teared wow. up wow. and he mocked himself crying. And he turned to me and he goes, boo hoo, I'm crying. Wow. And everybody in the room, you could feel everybody got chills. It was just like... And it really resonates with uh, what my mother taught me is that when you cry, you release emotion. Mm -hmm. That's what we know. But we, you also are getting toxins out of your body through the tears. Oh. You're like, and I mean, it's like healthy to cry, ah. you know. So he was embarrassed about crying? Well, he made fun of it, but you know, you can see he was that type of guy. You know, he didn't want to just say, I'm crying. When I told uh, you, probably know her, the woman who handled his art at Bergamot, I told her that story, and she goes, Mike was a sensitive guy. Hmm. And she knew that he was the type who would cry, you know. Well, anybody that made that art, you know, I mean, yeah. So, do more artists have moral obligations? Hmm. Well, from who to what is the question. But, <laughs> That's um, it. From who to what? <laughs> um, that is good. I mean, I think we, like all humans, have an obligation to try to be maintain integrity and do as good as we can do. But that might mean creating transgressive work, you know. It yeah. Might 
being all kinds of things that the world might not consider to be moral. So like everything else, it's in the eye of the beholder. But I think it's not it's not special to artists. Right. This question. It's very good. You know. it's very good. Because uh, you know how I get a lot? People go, everybody has a moral obligation. But it's like sometimes artists have to do something that may appear to be not moral to make their art. Right. So then, uh, you know, what do we do? And then there's the whole question of separating the art from the artist. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, yeah, a that's a tough one because sometimes like there's an artist I really like and then you also hear about their sexual harassment or yeah. the way they treat people or they yell at people and they belittle people. It's really hard to then go back to that art and still yeah. love it the same way. Sometimes I can, but it's really difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to deal with because, you know, so are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? Hmm. I, 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 I'm afraid I won't have any new ideas. <laughs> um, I'm not so afraid of ideas, you know. But, that's but good. that sounds too, you know, above it all. That, that's that's more. No, actually, Janie, that's the answer. I often get that. I'm not afraid of ideas, uh -huh. you know, and that's fine because it's for people I, our age. It's usually like I'm afraid of the old ones because we've had fascism and war oh, yeah. around so long. It's like, could we could we get I mean, literally, don't you think we're smart enough to get over war at by now? I know. I mean, that's like, one of my laments. It's like. We already know it doesn't work. I know our economy is based on it, but can it be based on something else? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Jerry, that's to me one of the biggest questions. And I just always feel kind of naive when I ask that to myself or to say somebody, I really don't like what's going on in the world right now. But then like, well, the socioeconomic dependencies yeah. and blah, blah. And it's all true, but it's... it's um, it's part of our nature, I guess, but I wish this part of our nature wasn't there. Well, that's that's funny you say that because I'm doing a lecture at a film festival in March and it's called Can Art Stop War? And people are like, no, art can't stop war. You know, but we know that art can contribute to shifting people's opinions yeah. and, uh, you know, strategies for conflict resolution. But, um, the big issue is that I asked the round robin question to all the participants is, are we hardwired for violence, killing? And most people think we are. And there's a woman, Maria Gambudis, uh, the archaeologist who proved, you know, in, in the anthropology world kind of proved that there were cultures that had no war. It was goddess-centered cultures mm -hmm. that, you know, women give birth. They're not about to, that we're, we're more hardwired to be cooperating than fighting. Mm -hmm. So, but it's hard to convince people that most people think, no, we're hardwired to fight because if they're coming to steal your food, then you're going to say no, you know, and fight them. So, yeah. I, yeah, all that stuff is just, it's, it's, no, it's one of those things. What is the answer? Is there an answer? To, yeah. You know, but like you, I, I like to imagine the possibility. Um, and it's not existing right now. Yeah, imagine is the key word. That's why Yoko takes a lot of money that she got from John Lennon's estate and put takes a full page ad in the New York Times War is over if you want it. I'm like, that alone, just to put that idea in yeah. a newspaper in big letters is powerful. You know, yeah. it's saying it's war, war is over if you want it. If you can imagine it, if everybody imagined it at once, would it happen? <laughs> and she, she's right, but it that's that would be a almost superhuman feat for everyone to imagine that at once. But hey. Yeah, we can imagine it. Yeah, if if you don't have dreams, your dreams can't come true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> can you conjure up your earliest memory or one of them? Well, the one that, you know, people ask that of each other a lot. The one that I remember remembering the most, my mother said I was probably two and a half or not quite three. 
which was light. It was a memory of light coming into our house through Venetian blinds. You know, yeah. and you know how that light just can move and be dazzling. And I just remember this certain room with that light. Another memory, I don't know when this would be, which probably a lot of people have, is reaching up for a doorknob. Yeah. Wow. Well, a lot of people say uh, something that's visual. That's mm -hmm. the earliest memory. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Oh, I think it's a blessing. Yeah. Tell me something. You know I mean, that's, I know people who have a lot of trauma in their childhoods. So that might be a whole different answer. You know, I yeah. have a totally happy childhood. Yeah. Tell me someone within your immediate family and then outside your immediate family, just briefly, who had an impact on you, kind of like a role model. And mm -hmm. what specifically was that impact? Oh, now I'm going to get teary eyed. My mom just died. Uh, certainly, she had a huge impact. Um, she was somebody who, for whatever reason, she didn't. I mean, my sister corrected me. I, I said, oh, she didn't judge anybody. But my sister said, that's not true. But but she she only occasionally <laughs> judged anyone. And she tried to see why maybe they did something, even if it felt wrong and not, and, and just talk with them about it. And she, she just had a kind of open receptor for people and, their problems and the world, you know. I don't know how she got that. I mean, her, I'm, her mother was also pretty amazing like that. Uh, her father had a stroke when I was a kid, so I didn't really get to know him. But I get the sense that that was also kind of what, what she got. So she would be somebody. I mean, another person was also my Aunt Winnie, um, my mother's brother's wife, Winnie. She made things like she would knit. She, she taught me to crochet. She, she lived in Dubuque, Iowa. She would make those braided rugs. I couldn't believe somebody could make a rug. And yeah. whenever, whenever we would come to visit, she would make my sister and I little purses and, you know, just she made stuff. So that was very exciting. And then she later, you would love this. She she had thrift stores. <laughs> and nice. She stuff and she sold them and she fixed dolls. And, yeah. So she was another really great influence on me. And I think I, I was able to tell her that, and, you know, when I was a little older. And I don't think she realized that she had had that impact until I told her. That's beautiful. You really uh, are well with describing because I feel like I can picture her with her dolls and how you described it. So uh, Janie, the same question outside your immediate family, someone who had an impact on you early on that uh, kind of was like a role model and what specifically hmm. was that impact? Well, I had a French teacher in high school and she, she was one of those great teachers that she talked to you like you had intelligence. She didn't yeah. talk down to people. And she expected, expected a lot of you. So much yeah. so that I even started college as a French major just because she she really instilled a love of language in me, which I haven't retained my French that well, but a kind of way of learning that was experiential and not... not uh, and and yeah, she she was really strict and rigorous, but she had a sense of humor and invited us in. And she's the only teacher. I had a good friend who was always in those French classes with me too. And we went back to visit her, you know, like 20 years later. And she's the only teacher that I ever did that with. You know. Nice. She was, she was funny too. And and my friend and I would kind of we just got bored in school, so we would do little disruptive things like get a wind up car and send it through the, under the desk. And she, she wouldn't give us a hard time about that. Oh, great. I'd just pick it up and put it on her desk or something. But. <laughs> so um, Janie, you told me you're raised Catholic. Do you pray? Not in that way. No. Yeah. 
yeah. if God if God exists, what would you like God to say to you after you die? It's all okay. Beautiful. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Number two. Yeah. I, mean, I often think about, you know, we've all we all see babies. And when you meet a baby who's just been born, you just think, okay, we all start out the same. I mean, maybe there are physical things or, you know, biological issues that happen that they can't help, but there's a that idea of like being born innocent and receptive is seems true to me. So yeah. whatever happens to that person that becomes evil happened to them and warped whatever it was that they started out with. Yeah, the, the follow-up question really is, is how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'll set it up. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Mm. Cop Coppola stole from the mob and the samurai. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And, and Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you respond to Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. It depends how you acknowledge them. I mean, if you're just acknowledging them in your head and going like, okay, this, this person I need to watch out for. That's one thing. But on, on that sort of thread, the idea of revenge or avenging, you know, something because your enemy does something and you, I think is useless. I think revenge really acknowledges your enemy and gives them power um, because you're wasting your time on them and um, showing them how powerful you think they are, that you have to put their power down. Um, I'm kind of more JFK, but it's, it's not always easy to totally forgive, but forget, maybe like just I, I just, I'm not a conflict. I don't like conflict. So no. I'm sort of on the extreme, that direction. You know, I, I'll it's, stand up for myself, but I won't seek obvious revenge. Yeah. It's really wise words. I learned a lot. Thank you. Because uh, Mark Twain says, forgiveness is the smell the flower gives off when the foot steps on it. <gasps> oh, <my> God. Because, <laughs> yeah. It, People, people wonder about forgiving. I mean, it's amazing. I think a key is forgiving, but sometimes they think, oh no, forgiving, you know, there's. Yeah, you get accepted on. Yeah. It's, yeah. But, you know, Nassim Talib says another one. He says, games were created to give non heroes the illusion of winning. In real life, we don't know who wins or loses, but we can tell who a hero is. So then my friend said, well, villains don't think they're bad. They want control. Heroes mm -hmm. want freedom. And then Gregory Bateson says, if the criminal gets caught, does he go, oh, my criminal skills weren't up to snuff that day? <laughs> or does he go, wow, I did something morally and socially wrong? So again, it's a lot of prompts, but the basic question is, does punishment work? I think... It depends. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly think prisons don't work. Um, I mean, once in a while, of course, you probably need to put somebody away from society in some way because they're causing so much harm to them or to themselves. But I don't know. There has to be something besides the punishment. There has to be something that you learn through that experience of maybe there, a realization of transgressing in a way that is harmful to other people. I don't have the answer to this, Jerry, but, but, but no, Janie, it's good because this is a follow-up question I've been asking. If Trump gets thrown in jail, he writes a book and says, I'm sorry, I did wrong. Would you forgive him? <laughs> I just wouldn't believe him. Right. That's what most people go. They go, I wouldn't believe him. I wouldn't have have to forgive him because first of all, he yeah, I don't know, whatever. But but he, he's not gonna write that book because he his book is, you know, I'm a victim. Yeah. 
heavy. Oh, I'm a victim like you. Exactly. <laughs> He's constant. So James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin, and he basically checked out. He said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Um, I think it's a distilled version of life. Yeah. That helps us, just like any kind of art, just helps us to look at it in a in a removed way. You know, it's, yeah. it's not happening to us. It's happening in front of us or yeah. in, in our brain. And, it, you know, all the, you know, archaeology or any kind of history that we have that has some kind of documentation, we, we've always told stories. Um, so stories are a way of distilling meaning and, and teaching, I think, too. Yeah. So, um, Janie, walk us through your, where's your tipping point? You already said, you know, you're learning making stuff from your aunt. Then you you're, you're have this curiosity to create, but then you go to school to study French. Where's your tipping point? You go, oh, that's my calling, being an artist. Well, after a semester of French and well, I was one of those kids that sort of did well in school without making myself crazy, you know, so I could, I knew how to study and memorize and all that. So then when I got to college and I was studying French, I was just doing more studying and memorizing and I was bored out of my mind. And I, I, I did, had had a desire to take some art classes or something. And so I took one. I was at the University of Georgia. So that was a good thing because I didn't have to apply to an art school to take an art class. I just signed it up on my schedule. And, and, and in fact, my advisor, who was just an advisor who didn't really know me, you know, because it's a school with 30,000 people. Um, he said, why do you want to take that? I said, well, I just always had a curiosity. Like, oh, okay, you know. And then the next, the next, it was actually a quarter. So the end of my freshman year, I, I said, oh, I'm gonna make art my major now. And then he was like, okay, goodbye. You know, now you go over to the art school advisors or whatever. But I took, I took, I had the best first art class in the world. And my art yeah. teacher, I think, is still alive. His name was Richard Olson, and he had sort of been part of the abstract expressionist movement. Yeah. And so he taught this class. I don't know if he made it up or not, but it was called Art in the Dark. Wow. Yeah. And so instead of starting out like, well, here's a still life or here's a body that we have to try to draw and get it right. He was kind of brilliant. And maybe this is how he had studied somewhere, but in the dark, in a black room, he would flash slides of like a Franz Klein painting. And we had five seconds to get the gesture of it with charcoal. So you go like, <laughs> so, so I couldn't make a mistake, you know? And oh. I felt so alive. And um, by the end of the quarter, we were trying to draw still lives and I wasn't as freed up and good with that, but he had already, kind of helped me open up that insecurity that I had because everybody else in the school, in the art program had been those kids that are drawing all through elementary and high school, you know, and they, they had their stuff up and all over the school and that wasn't me. So I felt really behind and, and I stayed kind of behind until just about the end of college. I maybe caught up, but I didn't get ahead or whatever. There were always so many people who I just thought were so amazing and that wasn't me. But what I did discover was sort of process and just pleasure, the pleasure yes. of making yes. things. And I just thought, this is what I wanna do. And I remember, is, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Process and pleasure. I love those two words. Yeah. And I was just so lucky that he was my first teacher, you know, because yeah. somebody else could have just killed that. Or I, I could have easily been intimidated by all of this. And I still was somewhat intimidated. Like, 
I really only took one painting class because I just felt too insecure about that. I took more drawing and printmaking because printmaking had a process. You know, you would coat the plate and you would draw into the wax to get a print and etching. Oh, you dip it in acid. And so I liked that process. And then I even did like some metal work where, you know, you make it in, in wax first and then you make a mold and then you pour the metal in. So all of those that I felt safer with that kind of process. Um, and, you know, I wish I had been more brave to do more of painting, but I did that more when I got out of school. And, um, so, and Janie, where's your tipping points to pursue puppetry and then film? Okay, well, I, I got out of school and I just did like drawing and painting. First of all, they're cheap and portable and you can do them anywhere. And I was living in Atlanta and, and doing that. But when I was in college, I, I had seen this woman on campus doing a puppet show, like a hand puppet show. Yeah. And it just seemed really cool what she was doing. And I asked her about it and she showed me how she made her paper mache puppets. And then I was for a summer job, I was teaching like gifted kids um, in a summer program where I just had to kind of come up as a college student with their whole curriculum. And, and so I, I thought, oh, well, let's do a puppet show because they could make things, they could write things, they could perform it. I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing, but luckily when you're working with 10 year olds, they, they know what they're doing all the time. Yeah. And you just have to kind of start something and they run with it. So th they made a, a marionette show and it was just really fun. Um, so I just kind of kept that in my brain as like something that was interesting. And every once in a while I would, I, I actually I made a puppet in one of my last classes, which was like a weaving class. So for my final project, I made like a stitched puppet, but I wasn't performing with them. They were objects. You know? And I continued to make occasional puppet like objects while I was getting my start in Atlanta, you know, as a little visual artist and starting to show my work, which was mainly the drawings and stuff. Um, but that stayed there. And then Atlanta, this was another sort of strangely lucky thing, I guess. There was a puppetry center and there still is in Atlanta. Wow. Um, yeah, called the Center for Puppetry Arts. Now they have half of the Henson um, collection. So they had this big museum that is a destination in Atlanta. But at the time they were, they were mainly a kid's puppet theater. They had a nice small collection in their lobby of donated, you know, antique puppets, some beautiful things. And, but Vince Anthony who ran the center and is still involved with it, he really wanted to have adult contemporary puppet theater at the center. And he started to develop an audience for that in Atlanta. And um, I heard about this, a friend of mine saw a PSA on, on late night TV about this guy doing this beautiful kind of puppet performance. And she told me about it so much, go see it. Did, have you always lived in Venice, Jerry? Um, I've been here 44 years. I was raised in Michigan, and then I came out here 44 years ago. Okay. Well, maybe you heard of him, Bruce Schwartz. I'm not sure, but I've seen some puppet art in in uh, in L.A. over the years. He he lived in Venice for a long time. Wow, it's been a while, and and he stopped doing puppetry, and and has had several other really amazing uh, parts of his life. He was part of Act Up. And uh, then he became uh, like a had a yoga studio in Pasadena. Um, so he he was this artist who really started getting attention and success very young. I don't know if he was in his teens, but at least his early 20s and touring the world with these one person performances where he did. Um, these very delicate Victorian looking figures that he would just kind of do little vignettes with and then on the flip side of that, he did a very raucous kind of Elizabethan hand puppet show. So he kind of did both sides of the coin and he was very inspiring to me. Um, and I, I met him and I saw, his, I even visited him in Venice and saw his work. So I started seeing artists who were artists like myself in some way that who either had 
been doing puppetry since they were kids or had kind of found their way through some back door, usually in the visual arts or as actors to this forum, because it's so amazing, puppet, puppet theater. It's amazing. And it's so, it's, it's so, it feels like it was just natural for you to fall into filmmaking. So where's that transition where you're, you're getting deep into puppetry and then there's something that kicks you over into filmmaking. Right. Well, I, I, um, and I still do performance too, but the, the pandemic made that hard for a while, but I'm working on something. Um, well, when I first started doing puppet theater, I also encountered Susan Pitt's asparagus. Oh my God. What a, a revolutionary a, a double bill with a racer head. Oh my God. I want to see a racer head. And then I saw asparagus. And so that was kind of like seeing the puppetry. Like, I think it's this thing I was saying about material. Like, yeah. Using material as the medium to express yourself as opposed to like using me. Yeah. Or something. But, but that film just uh, so amazing. And so I went to go, I, I had met a guy who, teaches animation and, and taught animation in, at Georgia State University. And he showed me that kind of animation, like the frame by frame animation, yeah. and even gave me some animation paper. And I tried something and I thought, I don't have the patience for this, you know. But then I started seeing some other things like Jan Svankmeyer and yeah. just people who were taking other approaches to animation. And I started, you know, going to see experimental film. There was a place in Atlanta, Image, Image Film and Video, kind of like Film Forum or yeah, or these you know small but vital experimental film, you know venues. So I was just educating myself about that, but I knew I was still learning so much about the puppetry. So I did start making shows, and and um, I just felt like I didn't have time to learn film too, but I was just sort of educating myself. And then at a certain point, I thought, oh, I could incorporate the film in the performances. So that's kind of how that transition happened, which is I got a Super 8 camera and I was shooting some live stuff, but like say I did a piece that was sort of about childhood and fairy tales, you know, but a very adult piece. And, and I, just film some girls playing like those hand games that you play or jumping rope and projected that on a small part of the set. So I would have these film sections or um, I filmed, you know, backgrounds and projected them with, with 60 millimeter projectors on scrim. They were never bright enough. So thank God for digital projection for theater. Um, but I just started incorporating it as part of the mise-en-scene of the performances too. So um, in that way, then I was learning. So by now I had moved to New York in the mid eighties. So I, I took a super eight class at school of visual arts. And then I took a, a 16 millimeter Bolex class at millennium film archive. Um, so, and then I started renting a camera at Millennium and they had editing rooms. You could go in and work on the Steenbeck. So I just slowly got more and more skill, you know, felt comfortable with film. And then eventually, I met, so first they were just parts of my performances. That's how I was using the film. And I liked what it did to the performance space to have this other form mixed in with them. And then I made, like a little puppet, puppet film, not stop motion, but filming sets and puppets live to make a little film to be a kind of standalone part of a performance thinking, okay, this film could also just kind of go out on its own. And so that was the first like film film and it was called Babbletown. And from that, I, I realized I don't really, <laughs> I don't like working this way. It's too constrictive to have the live puppets and try to make what I want to see without a lot of sticks and hands in the frame. So then I made, decided to try animation. And that film was The, the Red Book, um, which was sort of like my first real film, I think. Well, Janie, that was a good wrap up because you've 
<laughs> really done a lot, including installation and, and uh, teaching. You know, a screenwriting teacher told me great film is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. <clears throat> Kubrick says the opposite. Great film is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. What role does intention play in your creative process? Uh, I, I probably have the effect that Kubrick was describing. It's like, I have intention when I'm making a film. I usually will have like an emotional landscape or even a subject or sometimes even a story that is guiding me to making the film. And sometimes I'm discovering it as I go. I'll start yeah. a place and then that leads me to this and that. Um, but I know that when people see my films, I think they can feel that there is intention, but they don't always know what it is. And that's yeah. fine. It's more like a painting. Yeah. As long as it feels like it has some intention, even if. It's really good. Really know. good point. I rarely hear that said. Mm -hmm. And so the feeling of intention that, you know what, that reminds me of uh, Sammy Wasson's book on Bob Fosse. He said, Bob Fosse's dancers dance like they're dancing. <gasps> oh, <that's beautiful. laughs> so like, yeah. So I, mean, in fact, I don't really know exactly what that means, but it, right. it, it but it, but it, but it's it sort of like you saying you have the feeling of intention, but you're not going to say I have intention. You have like, I feel, well, this is somewhat similar as Duchamp said, there's no art without an audience. How much are you thinking of your viewer when you're making your art? I'm not thinking about who they are because I don't know who they are. Um, I'm just thinking, I, when I'm making it, I'm making it more for the for the love of making it and for the process yeah. and to engage with this feeling of making sense of the world for myself. Yeah. And then as I finish it, I, I wanna at least put it into some kind of shape that maybe somebody else can have some kind of experience with, but yeah. I don't know what. I can't determine that. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be um, flip about it. I, I don't, I just don't say like, Oh yeah, now this is ready for them to have this certain experience. Cause I don't really yeah. know who them is and what that experience will be for them. Very good. You know, McLuhan says that everything we invent has extended some humanness. So like knife and fork extends our teeth. The shutter and a camera or projector extends our eyelid. And maybe even non-tangible a religion or philosophy extends consciousness. The two things, two tools of yours, mediums you were, what does the puppet extend for you? What humanness? He called it a human sensorium, but you know what I'm saying. What yeah. humanness, what humanness are you extending with a puppet? I mean, puppets, what, we were just talking about this in a class that I'm teaching, and I, and I was having, we all read out loud together this great essay, essay by John Bell, which is called Death and Performing Objects. And he talks a lot about how, what artists who are dealing with materials as their form, uh, and puppets being part of that, like we're engaging with dead matter, wood, metal, cloth. These are not alive. And that engagement with dead matter. Now, John, I'm, I'm, I'm probably misparaphrasing this, but it, it, it does a lot of things. It, yeah. It, it helps remind us that we're alive. It helps give us power in the, in the dead world. Um, and, and it just, puppets, you know, anybody that works in puppetry will sort of come to this phrase of like, the puppet is a vessel, um, as much art is, but the fact that it's a, a, a vessel that has this confusing existence as something that kind of seems alive, even though we know it's not. Um, it, just, it just creates this amazing space for all kinds of ideas and emotions and, and, um, 
remembrances and references. You know, so they're very powerful. You know. It's amazing. Really good. Now the moving image camera, whether it's a, su a Super 8, Bolex, or video camera, mm -hmm. what does the moving image camera extend for you? What humanness? Uh, well, like you said, sight, but also movement and yeah. materiality because yeah. of the, especially what I'm shooting is the material world. So yeah. all those textures and, and you know, uh, images, photographs, they all just kind of extend memory also, I think. Not a specific memory, but the idea of memory. Yeah. They're kind of raw shots. You, that's good, Janie. You brought up the word storytelling earlier there in the Hollis Frampton said, narrative is born among the animal necessities of the spirit because we're waiting to die. Ah. Can you forget to die? Um, not most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> You're implying you can some of the time. That's pretty good. <laughs> no, sometimes I think we all just forget about dying. Yeah. That's not my main thought when I'm doing something, but it yeah. is, we're all aware of it. And I think yeah. that's another thing that puppets do. They kind of like remind us of our life and death. That's good. Yeah. Well, I spoke with Michael Apted 40 years ago, and I said, why do rock video editors feel so obliged to edit fast? You know, Abel Gantz invented rapid montage in 1922, but it really flourished in the 80s with MTV to the point where Marty Scorsese said, I cut my films faster because of MTV. Huh. So Michael Apted said, because we've learned to take in information faster. And I asked this question with a bias. Can we literally learn to take in information faster or are we just brainwashed to believe we can? I, I think we've learned to take it in faster. I'm not saying we're taking it in as fully. Yeah. I, I think that a lot of the things about fast cutting also, if you think about, you know, music and rock and roll and experimental music, like formal inventiveness makes us take notice and yeah. it makes us work. So experimental film, of course, is one of the main sources of the formal invention that gets pulled into music video and now like the news and everything. Um, yeah. So as it emerged in experimental film, it really was a formal invented inventiveness, like defamiliarizing yourself with something wow. that you know and causing yourself and the viewer to have to look at it differently. I love that. I, I say the word unlearn. We have to unlearn, but defamiliarize. That is a great word. Thanks for teaching me that. So um, what's your hunch or guess? What was the motive of the cave artist? Oh, Oh, that's funny. We were also thinking about that in one of my classes. Not the motive. Well, you know, they they suspect, whoever they is, the experts, that caves had a kind of camera obscura effect sometimes. Yeah. Where a little bit of light would come in and show the outside world on the wall. You know, some of those drawings are upside down. You know, so it could be even tracing that. But I think just like us, they're telling stories. They're making sense of their world. They're, it gives you some power over your life to be able to depict it, to put it there as a static image. Um, I don't really know. I'm just riffing. No, that's that's good. I, you really covered a lot there. And it leads to, um, and we're doing a research project on archiving. And the basic question is, there's two, is is archiving more innate or more invented? And do you have plans for your own archive? But I wanted to set it up because the word archive etymologically is rooted to keep safe, free from harm. Um, and that's the 1400, 200 years later, 1600s. It's what we know it as a record preserved as evidence. Hmm. But, you know, the Egyptians would keep, put stuff in their coffin with them. But I also learned from studying Eastern philosophy that, you know, Ram Dass says, be here now, like right. live in the present. And even Wyndham Lewis kind of nailed it. He said, artists live in the present and write a detailed history of the future. 
uh. which is an amazing thing. But why do you think humans, I mean, I know it's this sense of uh, history, important. And then you even got the futurist saying, dude, burn all the libraries and museums down. I like that they invented that, but I live half my life in a library. I like libraries. Yeah. Do you think this need to archive is more innate or more invented by humans? I think it's an impulse, probably yeah. like the squirrel putting nuts away, you know, that yeah. maybe the first impulses had to do with survival. Um, like you save all the good rocks that might be turned into blades before the river overflows and gets rid of all of them. Um, that's just made up. But um, but in terms of my own archive, I have two threads. One, well, the main one is I don't want to leave all this stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff um, for someone else to deal with. Yeah. Um, and so maybe 10 years ago, I started trying to find an archive that would take my puppets that I'm not using. You know, I have all these old shows. I've, I've kind of ended up getting rid of a lot of the sets and some of them were painted with paint that didn't survive. It started to smell bad, um, but I still have most of my puppets and I would really like to give them away. So if anybody out there. Um, but did you find an archive with that? Yet. Not yet, but in that process, I put out the word to different friends and stuff. Um, a good friend named Chip Epstein, who is a musician and composer, it's E-P-S-T-E-N, um, who I worked with a, on a lot of my early performances. He was my collaborator uh, on just really beautiful work. But anyway, he I had been talking to him and telling him, oh, I'm just trying to find some place for these puppets. And then he was at a party in Atlanta and, and his wife is an architect. And, and at this party was an archivist from Emory University. Yeah. And part of his mandate was archiving Atlanta's art scene during a certain time period uh, and especially around this institution now called the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center that started out as a little nonprofit called Nexus. And I had happened to be involved in that. So anyway, he was telling Chip about what he did, or maybe even Dogmore, his wife. And then they said, oh, you should talk to our friend Janie. So they put us in touch. And he ended up, for Emory, taking ephemera. He didn't take the puppets. They don't take 3D stuff. They're interested gotcha. in sketchbooks, notebooks, you know, all kinds of you know, things you collect, like my postcard collection or just different things where you intersect with no. daily life. So they took 55 boxes. Oh, stuff. right. So now it's stored in a university. Yeah. And of yeah. course, those processes take a long time for it to get digitized. Oh, yeah. I will probably be on the other side. Um, <laughs> but at least my son won't have to deal with them. Those it's, it, boxes, it's, you know? it's beautiful. You have a sense. I actually met my archivist at a party, too. Oh. And it was just, like, but it does take long. Well, so it, what, where where do you have your well office? I'm in Santa Barbara University of California Santa Barbara they have all all the VHS from my film festival is 33 years old all, they're mainly VHS tapes and my interviews are mainly audio cassette you know pre oh, yeah. now it's online oh. but I'm pretty lucky but it does take long to just yeah. process and yeah. you, you you when you get in an archive you learn what priority you are of the, all the clients. It's like, <laughs> you're, you're thankful, yeah. Yeah, I will say Mark Toscano at the Academy. Oh, Mark is a- Has yeah. been, um, he yeah. reached out to a lot of experimental filmmakers, yeah. himself included, and he has a lot of my elements. And Good. One print of every print, and I think he has hard drives of digital stuff, but I need to check with him on that. And then I have things at some other archives, like the Pacific Film Archive at Berkeley. Oh, good. And yeah, PFA. They have a lot of print. They bought a lot of prints recently in the last. Well, Janie, years. you're doing good in the archive department. Just naming those three sources. I, <laughs> so let's move on. Um, what's more important, conviction or compromise? Ooh. Hmm. Again, the binary is hard. Yeah. You know, like, I think you have to have conviction about what you believe and stand up for it. 
but also the ability to compromise is important because the, you'll end up like our country is right now if you don't compromise. You know, Beautiful. just like yeah. And so, um, in your accomplishments, how do you rate these three elements overall? Luck, skill, and ambition. What played the biggest role, second and third? I would say skill, meaning I worked at it, not like I was yeah. born with it. Skill, yeah. luck, and ambition. Yeah. Luck is a big one. Maybe that's first. I don't know. But you have to have something to be lucky about. So you have yeah. to have some work that you're doing in order. I would I would put it at work instead of skill. Yeah. yeah. No, people change the words. They say persistence, necessity, purpose. Yeah. But I like uh, Gary Player, the golfer, said, the more you practice, the luckier you get. Yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah. T.S. Eliot said, poetry is outing your inner dialogue. What language is your inner dialogue in? Mm -hmm. It's in pictures. Yeah. You got to hear it. You know, Abigail Childs. Oh, yeah. 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 I said, I asked her that question. She goes, I wish I knew. <laughs> that is a great, like, I wish I knew the language my inner dialogue was in. It's really beautiful, but I love you saying pictures. So George Mandupelli started the Ann Arbor Film Festival over 60 years ago. His mantra was ignore yourself. Jonas Mika says there is no self-expression. And Cecil Taylor, jazz pianist, says, I'm just a vehicle and this stuff comes just goes through me. So again, it's a binary, but just your thoughts. Is art making more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for whatever technologies and cultures and environments are dominant? I, I feel more like a vehicle, but, yeah. but I don't want to say, oh, I'm psychic or anything, but yeah. I, you, the ideas come in from somewhere yeah. and you can't force them. And yeah, it's like when I'm film, filming, I don't always know what I'm doing. So yeah. I'm a vehicle for something, but I don't know what it is. That's good. Can art making be egoless? Probably not. Maybe, but you know. Yeah. Self, you're you're doing it. There's some yeah. um, there's some conviction of being able to enter these processes safely and with some purpose. That the ego must be part of that. Yeah, is perception reality? Sometimes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I mean, I think perception is real. Yeah. It's so good. It's reality. Yeah. Lewis Carroll says, I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Have you believed in any impossible things lately? Well, like you, I believe, or like Yoko, that maybe if we just thought about it, we could end more. But that's so, I feel so like naive to even believe it, but I'm going to let myself believe it. <laughs> I like that. Janie, tell me one major element of your creativeness that's changed and one major element that stayed the same in the years you've been doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I started out drawing and painting and that's just really not part of my process anymore. Yeah. Um, and that really surprises me. And I'll, I'll leave. I do sometimes draw in the sense of thinking you know, like little, little things in a notebook, not to be drawings, but as a form of thought. So I do do that. So I would say that's the major thing is that I, I would originate the image through a complete, without other materials to do that. It would just come out of, I mean, I use paint or whatever, but now I work often in a more collage way, um, even in the performances, working with some found, um, text material, say. Uh, so it's a movement toward responding maybe than originating totally, if that makes any sense. And what was the second part of the question? And then it was what has remained the same in the years you've been pursuing? Uh, well, I would say this love of process and yeah. reality and yeah. engagement. I mean, for me, part of it is just doing it. It is. I have such pleasure in oh, I have time, I can just shoot for a while or I can yeah. carve something for a while or 
just so so it's just the engagement and making yeah beautiful <clears throat> so moshi feldenkrais works with healing and movement he says it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness mm. tell me a weakness you turned into a strength hmm. i don't know i mean i'm shy i'm very intro ultimately kind of introverted but the kind of work I make that definitely is a strength, I think, in that I'm very comfortable with being off by myself and just living in my head or wherever that is. So I think that's instead of being embarrassed about it, then I can do that. But also through different things I've done in my life, I also know how to be uh, in, in the social world and I'm comfortable in it and like teaching, you know. So somehow I've been able to take that internalness and turn it inside out when I need to. And 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 not that it's a pain, it, it, I enjoy it. Yeah, that's good. Cause I did want to ask you about being an educator. McLuhan said it's misleading to suppose there's any difference between education and entertainment. He oh. says, it's always been true, whatever pleases teaches more effectively. Hmm. So ma mainly I'm just those last kind of three or four words. Whatever pleases teaches more effectively. Well, what does effectively mean? Just your <laughs> thoughts about that, especially being in some, um, institution like Cal Arts, which Disney started to funnel kids right into helping him, you know, make a career, yeah. make an entertainment career. And then he got Pee Wee Herman and Mike Kelly and went, uh oh, <laughs> you know, but you know, I mean, you know what your students are there for. Are they there more to get a job in the entertainment business? Are they there more to be a fine artist? Yeah. And is, is that something you learned when you, how did you learn to be an educator to please your students or figure out they were there to learn through pleasing? Well, if I'm enjoying it, then I hope they are. I mean, I do think there is something to making an environment that sort of catalyzes them, you know, offering suggestions that then they run with, but it can be kind of fun. You know, I think it's okay to have fun learning serious yeah. stuff. Um, so I, I, I don't get up there and tell jokes because that's not what I'm good at, but I do do my best to have a sort of positive environment where more of a laboratory environment where nice. I show them nice. some things and then there's space to make something that's yeah. very unproscribed, you know, just a hint of what the parameters are, but not a lot of boxing for it and then for me and i tell the students this all the time they make things in an hour and i'm like, whoa what what happened you know there's just incredible magic that happens from their focus and concentration their investment in the process in the moment and in each other you know so yeah i have some really you know that's the blessing of cal arts but it's anywhere i've been as a guest i've seen this too that you know if you kind of can create that space more than give a lecture, um, for me anyway, that's how I get over my shyness is I don't get, just stand up there and talk all the time. Um, but that space, if it's kind of a freeing space, like that first class I had, you know, nice. so I learned it from Dick, Dick Olson, I guess. I never put that together. Beautiful. What's the most significant difference between men and women physical aside? I don't, that's not, I don't think it's, you can generalize. It really yeah. does. That's the answer, Janie. It's interesting because that's the answer I really want to hear. <laughs> but, you know, for a while when Me Too started, I couldn't answer, even ask the question. Oh, wow. But I, I do love that you saying that. There's a line that goes, you create what you resist. Bob Goldthwaite, the comedian, morphed it into, you are what you hate. Hmm. James Joyce says, it's a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. And Louis Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. So 
resist any thoughts on this line. You create what you resist. I'm not saying you, but one creates what one resists. Any thoughts on that line? Well, I can certainly go to the Catholicism. So I grew up Catholic. By the third grade, I knew it wasn't like I didn't believe it all, especially the idea of limbo, where babies no. didn't go to heaven unless they were baptized. So that's, you know, seven eighths of the world or more. I don't yeah. know. Um, so I just didn't buy it, but I had to kind of pretend until I could drive, you know, yeah. not go to mass, but cat the imagery and the smells of Catholic church and service just permeated into me. And yeah. I even have a form that I've used a lot in performance where I create a series of walkthroughs of stages that you have to walk through to see the piece or yeah. you stop at one and you watch for a couple of minutes then you go to the next it's the stations of the cross you know exactly so, amazing so i definitely i don't even remember exactly what your question was well no you answered it well stained glass window yes yeah, stained, stained glass window stained glass window the ritual and yeah. you love this frank zappa learned about um, sculpting air molecules. That's what he said he did as a musician wow. because he was in church, raised a Catholic, mm -hmm. and he watched the candles waver when the chorus sang. Oh. So he saw that the air was causing the candles to waver. Now, you know, that puts him <laughs> in, you know, a visual. So it's like him, Louis Bunuel, these guys are like, they dis. Catholicism and religion, but it's so much ingrained in them that it's part of their process and their content. Yeah. Oh, and and I love the 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 like the teeth in a saint statue, or like the remnants of the human body that were put there, like as relics yeah. to kind of worship. Um, so that mixture of the inanimate with the once alive. Yeah. It's amazing. So we got about 10 more minutes. It's really been fun, Janie. And uh, here's five Alan Watts questions just off the top of your head in a couple words. One, who started it all? Somebody. Two, are we going to make it? Yeah. Three, three where do we put it? Um, wherever it's safe, I guess. Beautiful. Four. Who's cleaning it up? Us. Five. Is it serious? Not enough. <laughs> Very good. How do you find peace of mind? Uh, walking. I, I love to walk. I can walk all over. And where I live now, there's, it's, uh, you know, LA has these kind of nature in the city areas. So I'm kind of in a hillside area where there's houses, but then you round a bend and there's just a lot of hillside that's undeveloped, but it's about to get developed. Um, and so I like that and seeing, seeing, looking and seeing. So walking is kind of the main one. I love that. I have to tell you, one of my favorite ants, I used to do this in a survey form on a piece of paper. And one of the questions was, I would rather blank than blank. And she put, I would rather walk than do dishes. <laughs> Go for that. that was always one of my favorite things she said. Um, in, 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 in that regard, if you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to your 12-year-old self? Oh, wow. 12 was a kind of right when I started to really become unsure about a lot of things. Um, 12 and 13. And I also moved from one city to another. So my childhood city, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I felt like I understood, I knew the world and that was my world. And then we just up and moved to Atlanta and it was completely shaken. So I guess I could just say to her, it's all for the good. Because yeah. what I did have learned as an adult, like every time we moved, I had to make new friends, you know, I had to, I learned so much, like I did a good journey from uh, Baton Rouge to New Jersey. By the time I got to New Jersey at the end of high school, um, I was ready for the people there who were very influenced by New York City and who in high school were 
writing poetry and making art and doing all these things that, you know, really changed my life. So I would just say it's going to, it's going to be okay. All of this seems really traumatic now, but you'll, you'll make it. Beautiful. How many years have you been with Lewis? Um, wow. We just had our 30th anniversary. Beautiful. How do you explain the longevity of your relationship? It, it's, it's uh, a lot of compromise, and the fact I, the fact of our art, like that is a huge thing that joins us together in that we both are very obsessive. We both like to work. We like process our work, can talk to it, each other, and we understand what it is to be an artist. You know, and I'm not saying like artists being special, but just what your day is like. Well, yeah. you might just need to go into the studio for a few hours or you might just need to take a nap or a walk and that kind of fluid fluidity when we're not teaching. Um, and then we also have a, a son who's 26 or almost 26. So, of course, that's that joins us together a lot. Well, that was the uh, next question. You have ESP. What have you learned by raising a son? What's oh. your like main thing you learned, do you think? Oh, it's it's almost too big, you know, yeah. to say. Just to to not assume anything about who somebody is. Yeah. Just I'm getting choked up again. Um, to like notice who they are and what what another person needs, and try to find a way to help them toward that. Yeah. He's, he's like us and very different from us. Yeah like skateboarding, like neither Lewis or I are big athletes. You know, we're, we're, we were physical in a way, but not athletic in that way. Although Lewis was more, um, but our son was, you know, athletic, but only like one person sports. He didn't really like the soccer or the team. Yeah, sport. I see. And very early on started skating. It's beautiful balance. And yeah. so we spent a lot of time at skate parks. Yeah, so I just it just your kid can open the door to another part of, of the culture that I really wouldn't have had understood at all. Now I'm tattooing, you know, I understand wow. how tattooing is journaling. Yeah, you know, it's uh, amazing. Yeah, and skateboarding. I hate to say it, but you know, just cha chinged in on skateboards is Jeff Coons now sells skateboards. Oh, so. yeah, well. <laughs> God, is you can imagine. He a skater. No, he just found a niche where he could sell. But I don't know. Wait, believe me, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know if he's a skater, I but I, I, I doubt it. He's more our age, and he probably didn't grow up skateboarding. But he, I don't he know said, people, people our age skated. Yeah, but, but I'm trying to remember. Somebody I know was his roommate at some point, so I can find out. Yeah. <laughs> Which way should toilet paper come off the roll, over or under? Over. If a publisher was to release your autobiography off the top of your head, what would the title be? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> they want to scent the glue in the binding. What smell? Say that again. They want to scent the glue in the binding of your autobiography. What smell? Some kind of wax, maybe. Oh, um, nice. Like a if beeswax, you know? Beeswax is cool. If a statue was built in your honor, where would you want it displayed and what would it be made of? Um, it would be very small and in a closet somewhere. Nice. <laughs> I and don't maybe, want a statue in my honor. Right. Tell me something good you never had and you never want. Hmm. Wow. That, that one I'd have to think about for a while, Jerry. Something good I never had and I never want. It's not that there aren't things, but it's just nothing's coming to my mind. Right That's now. all right. <laughs> What's the cultural shift you see developing today that inspires you? Um, uh, I, I think a lot of you know younger people who I'm around, because of our son or also at CalArts, they they do care about each other. Yeah. And they try to support each other's 
and especially because I'm around art kids, idiosyncratic impulses that, that may not be like them, but they really try to make space for everyone's differences. And, you know, I might be in a very lucky environment, and it's not to say that there aren't problems too, but I think there's something about caring for each other. That's encouraging. You know, in your performance, because I was really impressed that besides being an artist with puppets and film, that you do live performance. There's a line that Leonard Cohen says, I'm curious your thoughts. The only way you can sell a concert is if you put yourself at risk. And if you don't do that, people know. What what role does risk taking play in your creative process? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, and I would say that performance is where I feel the most risk because you have the people in the room while you're still making it. You know, it's my friend Paul Zaloom. I don't know if he quoted somebody or this is his original thought says the difference between film and theater is theater is never finished. Yeah. You're always showing work that's only finished by the audience in a sense. And I would, I would propose that all art is similar, you know, in that the audience, yeah. whoever's viewing it is adding something else to the work. But in theater, I mean, for instance, one of my first puppet show, I don't usually perform in them now, but I was performing as a puppeteer and there were these, um, it was at the Center for Puppetry Arts and Vince Anthony had gotten these you know, European people to come see the show and the puppet fell off the set. Oh no. <laughs> it was like a real puppet booth. Right. The puppet I was holding, there was a point in the piece where I would leave her at, at the spot and then I'd go do something else and there was a little lock for that and somehow it gave way and it fell over. And this shows you how people believe in the puppet characters. Like the room was just like, ah! not just because here's a thing that's breaking, but this character is breaking her packed with us, you know? Right. And, and nobody could see me, I was down below, but one really kind person picked it up and put it back up there and kind of looked to make sure I got it. Um, oh, how cool. That was interactive art. Definitely. Yeah, so that's, so there's just that risk of liveness yeah. and of things happening in real time that you can't predict. Whereas by the time you show a film, like, you know, that is sort of finished, even if you're remaking it as you watch it. So then the problems come with projection or sound yeah. or all these other elements that you can't exactly control. But yeah. live performance, and I'm not even out there acting, you know, I think performers who get on the stage with just themselves, you know, dancers, um, actors, musicians have a task too. So they're, yeah. they have something else too, but it's, it's a real risk. I think. Yep. What's a question that remains unresolved for you? Um, just, you know, like how, what are we doing here? <laughs> that is good. What are we doing here? That's really good. Um, how has being an artist shaped your behavior? Uh, I mean, it's hard to know because I'm not on the outside looking in, but I think it's made, you know, the kind of work you need to do to make art is reflective. It's, it's self-motivated work. Yeah. You know, so I, I think it's it's helped me become like more and more um, uh, have more agency in the world. Yeah. In, in my life. You know? that, but I don't know in compared to what. But yeah, because I don't know that I have any more than anybody else. But for me, especially as a kind of shy person, um, it, it's really helped me just be in the world. Yeah. Thornton Wilder said in 1928, art is confession, art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one's secret, it's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. You've laid your cards on the table for 90 minutes. I'm not insinuating you haven't already answered this. What's it really all about for you? 
Well, I told you that's my question, but <laughs> <laughs> that's like touche, Jerry. That was good. <laughs> but it's it's really just about you know not in a rational way, but yeah, being sense of being, yeah, in the world through making through yeah. materials of the world, and then through interacting with people around that making. Yeah. No, I really love you saying, you said right off at the bat, looking, walking, you know, and being, it's like an awareness level. That's what I always say. It's like, you can be aware of what's around you. I, I know on, on that, like, I'm not like most people alive on the planet today, or maybe I'm, I, when I'm walking, like I had a Walkman when they came in, but I would really only use it at home. Because I yeah. found if I had it on when I'm out, I just feel too removed from the world. Right. And I realize I like the sound of the world. Exactly. I like the sirens. I like hearing yeah. these conversations. I want to be in the world when I'm in it. So, yeah. Now, being a bicycle rider, I'm the same way. Can people be aware of where their space is in the urban setting? You know, you can stare at your cell phone and walk down the street and, and do your whatever you're moving around. But there is an awareness of other people that you can be aware of or you can just be, you know, have your arms across the sidewalk like this. It's like, oh, someone else is coming, you know. But, but, but anyways, I, I, I understand the impulse to kind of create a cloud around you. Yeah. You know, and because we're as you said at the beginning, like we're, we have all this, we're learning, we are taking things in faster and faster. There's so much around us. So I do understand that just walking through and carrying your own environment with you, as long as you're watching the streets. Uh, right. As long as you're a little aware of the people around you. But again, it's like when the scooters came out, I said, you know, electric scooters, I did a big thing on it. And, um, and I said, well, can't they put them not blocking the sidewalk? Because what if you're blind? And my friend said, people who are blind have a stick. They'll hit it and go around it. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. But we, it, it is sort of civil kindness to, like, park the scooters so they don't block the sidewalk, you I know. Agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question, Janie. What gives you the most optimism? Hmm. Oh, I don't know, just one-on-one -on -one interactions with people, uh, teaching and being around these, you know, amazing beings who are starting out. And um, yeah, just there, the, it does seem like there's still good things happening and people caring about each other. That's great. You know, the first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? And Wilhelm Reich said, the best thing for a human being is another human being. Uh -huh. And the last question is what I got from, uh, they asked Groucho Marx at the end of his life, what gives you the most optimism? And he says, other people. Mm. So it's sure been fun spending this time with another person, especially because it was you, Janie. Thank you so much for your time and energy. It's really been delightful. And I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jerry. You're really great at what you do. Thank you. And uh, even though I'm going to hit the end broadcast button, I hope this never ends and we can keep talking forever and ever. Yeah. Maybe we'll <laughs> okay. see you somewhere in, somewhere in our city. We have, hopefully, David James will have another party. We can talk in person. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bye, Jerry. Okay. Bye. Thank you.